number 10, death photography. Has anyone out there looked at really old photos and had that eerie thought that everyone in that photo is dead now? I have. I know it sounds kind of weird, but it's just something that comes to mind sometimes. Back in the Victorian era though, they really had that thought because death photography became a trend at the time. Back then, people were dropping like flies. They dealt with a lot of illnesses like measles, scarlet fever, diphtheria, rubella, typhus, and cholera. Death was all around them, but with the rise of photography, this became a new way of keeping a memento of their loved one who passed away. Before this, they would keep locks of hair and other items from their loved ones, but once they got access to cameras, families started posing with their dead relatives. Literally. Families would often keep the bodies of their dead loved one in the house for days after their passing in order to have that mourning period, but soon they started staging photo shoots with the remains of their relatives, posing them and dressing them up to make it look like they're still alive. Family members would take pictures with the deceased to have one last family portrait before burying their loved one. It's kind of heartwarming in a way, but also really creepy. At number 9, Emigration. During the Victorian era, there was unfortunately a lot of orphan children living in the streets of London. It became a pretty big problem because of the sheer amount of young people without homes or families. It was estimated that around 30,000 children were living on the streets in London in 1869. Soon a program was put into place to try and solve this issue and people started rounding up these orphan kids and shipping them off elsewhere to work in some of the British colonies. Many of the kids who were shipped off ended up working as farmhands or as domestic servants. Though many children were shipped off to places like New Zealand and Australia, the majority of them went to Canada. About 80,000 of them actually. They were sent away with hopes that they would be able to live better lives, but unfortunately for many of those kids, they didn't end up having any better luck in compared to when they lived on the streets. This practice ended up becoming pretty controversial as you can imagine. Before we carry on talking about the strange things that happened in the Victorian era, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Mental Health. Back in the Victorian era, the study of the human brain and psyche was still relatively new, so no one really knew what was going on up in people's noggins. Mental asylums started to pop up and people started getting diagnosed with mental problems even if the diagnosis wasn't accurate. The three labels that a patient could fall under were the manic, the melancholic, and those with dementia. The symptoms for those big three labels often varied, and people were admitted to asylums for some pretty messed up reasons. There was a list of common causes for mental illness that people referred to back then, and it included things like, quote, laziness, novel reading, superstition, an immoral life, and intemperance, as well as the act of self-pleasuring. For women, they could also be sent to asylums for some pretty ridiculous reasons, like imaginary female trouble, hysteria, rumor of husband murder, and even fits of desertion of husband. I am so glad things have changed since then. Number 7. Diet Bedroom misconduct was becoming a huge issue. Refer to number 9 and 10. While women did get most of the blame because, well, you know, history, men did get some of the blame. The issue of intimacy for men could be described as barbaric primal sense. So how do we curb this? How do we stop men from acting on these caveman urges, ooga booga? Well, simple really. Men just have to stop eating certain foods, as it was thought at the time that food had a link to the misconduct, or rather, the overabundance of bedroom related issues, including mustard, pepper, rich gravy, beer, wine, cider, and tobacco. And if you weren't paying attention, that's basically the diet of every man in Victorian times. Not sure how a jar of finely prepped mustard would get you flustered, but okay, sure. The beer makes sense though, you know, have a few beers, and even the mop leaning over in the corner looks pretty lonely. And Boy, that mop has lovely hair. Number six, job market. Ladies of the evening, women of the night. Women who make beds go bump in the night. They were everywhere in Victorian London, a lot. It's partially related to some of the points I previously mentioned. Now, I'm not here to say it's necessarily a bad thing. Personally, I don't think it is. As they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, with an estimated 80,000 women working in the night by the late 1890s. You'd have to be crazy to miss that, I mean, they, they were literally everywhere. With numbers like that, there's something for everyone and in varying price ranges, as they can be found in brothels or townhomes set up by the wealthy men for their mistresses, pretty much anywhere trouble likes to spawn. Even some artists took advantage of this by living with the gorgeous girls of the evening, as going behind closed doors with one was debatable, but 
Becoming friends? Now that's a social transgression. That, oh, becoming friend. Oh, how dare you befriend the people of the night? Number five, Jolly Lad. When people think about certain magazines that depict lewd imagery, you probably only think of Playboy. The bunny imagery was good marketing, honestly, just, just smart. But what if I told you the Hefmeister wasn't the first to publish such a magazine or imagery? Back in the Victorian era, there was some saucy imagery being produced. The government had outlawed such indecency, but this only made the lewd picture industry move underground, where naturally it flourished, especially in major cities. And if you knew where to go and how to ask for one, you could purchase something from the hidden menu. Kind of like when you go to McDonald's. Yeah, there's a hidden menu there too. Google it and see for yourself. I'd repeat what my favorite one is, but I would be in trouble from the YouTube gods. And I've been treading on thin ice this whole video, so. Uh... Number four, the first counterculture. The 1960s were a very important time for many different people. Black Americans were fighting for the rights, music went from holding hands to strawberry fields, if you know what I'm saying, and everything that your parents told you just, just kind of felt wrong. If you grew up then, you know what I mean. I know people like to make fun of hippies, but there were some good ideas there. Well, in 1890s England, they were sort of having the same thing happen. Obviously, not as strong as a push as it was in the 60s, but still. Basically, after all the oppression towards bedroom relations, people began to open up. Uh, not literally, just, just open up thinking-wise. That's really gross, don't repeat that. There's only one way we all got here. Unless you're a test tube baby, of course. In that case, thank you for watching CT133576-2. To some historians, this makes sense. When you push and push for things to happen or ban, eventually people will push back, especially if it's something like bedroom time. Everybody, everybody likes a little bit of bedroom time. Valentine's Day wasn't too long ago. Remember that? It was good. It was fun. It was good, good fun. Number three, gym day. Believe it or not, there were around 200 gyms across Europe during Victorian times. Yeah, just like six good lives. So you're like, what? what's this about? Even Victorian dudes skip leg day. How great is that, okay? It's not just you. These gyms weren't bright, they weren't open, they weren't well ventilated, they weren't motivating, and definitely not safe. None of those, definitely not. No, Victorian gyms were reserved for the upper class, obviously. Grab your pocket watch and blazer, Ezekiel. We're doing squats today. These machines also were not ideal. They were designed as antiques first rather than their purpose. Also, half of these look like saw traps. Like, are you kidding me? No way I'd bend my arm around any of these devices. No way. All those wooden wheels? No. I'll stay weak and brittle. Thank you. Number two, ghost photography. I had to look back. I don't like talking about ghosts. As if the reanimated corpses coming back to life while they were ringing a bell wasn't scary enough. Yeah, let's talk about 1800s ghost photography. The camera was a hot new invention at this time, so tales of ghosts and spirits were now easily believed. Yeah, obviously, when you have a photo of a see-through woman, you're like, I, that must be, that's pretty terrifying. A big name in the ghost game was a man named William Thomas Stead. He was born in 1849 and Stead was the son of a Congregationalist minister and at the age of 22 he was appointed as editor of Northern Echo, which was a regional newspaper in Darlington. So far, so good. This British medium, Richard Borsonal, featured a photo of W.T. Stead and a real spirit. Yeah, imagine that. Imagine a day where somebody being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize also poses for photo ops with ghosts. You're like, I don't, do we believe all of this or none of this? What's going on? This is so scary. And finally, number one, music for eternity. Before we wrap up this wild part two, I had to include perhaps one of the creepiest patents of all time. Patent numero 9,222,059. Yeah, the number is going a little bit higher. This one got me thinking. I wanted to end this video off on this note. I like this idea. Maybe, I don't know yet. Music for Eternity Systems. Okay, this patent is not from the 1800s, but rather 2015. I know, it's not Victorian, but when else am I gonna talk about this, really? The idea here is that you could stay connected to your loved one by using a solar-powered digital music player. The best part here is the patent details how surviving family members now have the ability to update, revise, and edit stored audio files and programming after burial. Yeah, next Rihanna album, no problem, I got you. There's a speaker in the casket and there's a headphone jack on the tombstone so we can listen together and then we can decide if we hate the album. That's creepy. I wouldn't do this. Would you want this? Sound off below if you'd want, you know, big shiny tunes playing for eternity after you die. 
I would do the Titanic theme song, just make everyone so sad all the time. For 10, it's just a cold sore. The Victorian era is cool. The art, the fashion, and technology of the time, I think, are always fun to take a look at, especially since steampunk has its roots in the Victorian era, and who doesn't like steampunk? Come on, there's just a lot of cool steampunk stuff. And honestly, we haven't seen a lot of that in a long time. We need, we need more, we need more. Something not so cool from that era, however, was what you could catch from another person should you decide to take up a bed with another person. Syphilis, yep, one heck of a disease. Funny enough, it was so common that it was making intimacy itself an unusual practice. People were scared, and honestly, maybe rightfully so. There's no cure, and if it progresses to its later stages back then, well, you'd go crazy. And then you'd end up being that guy that's always screaming in the streets. Every city has one. You know what I'm talking about. Number nine, the French letter. The issues of intimacy and its repercussions were becoming quite clear in the Victorian era. Something had to be done, as spending any amount of time in the brothels could have you shucking barnacles off your lower deck in the morning, if you know what I mean. Introducing the revolutionary new invention, prophylactics. For those that are college age, you might find it disturbing that these party favors weren't made of rubber or disposable. Yeah, hear me out. They were made of sheep's guts and they had to be soaked first so they would become flexible. Because when you put these bad boys on, they had to be fastened on. It's not very good, not very attractive. Once the deed had been signed off on, the device was then washed and then hung up to dry like your dirty laundry. Once it was dry, it was placed in a small box for the next time. Because seeing your wife's ankles might make you feel a certain kind of way and now you just have it ready to go. And Number eight, the products of our sins. Having fun when the lights can be turned off is great. Who doesn't enjoy a little toe curling, yeah? Except sometimes there's this crazy thing that can happen where after nine months, another human spawns in. Insane, right? I know. Well, back in the Victorian era, this phenomenon was happening, but only for married couples. As you have to be married, of course, or else a child would be born out of wedlock, which to people at the time was just the worst. Oh, I never. These stigmas were not favorable for women, as some preferred to avoid that kind of press by abandoning or straight up just unaliving their children. Horrible, just, just horrible times. Just another one of those good old wholesome times in history where we were treating women with the utmost respect and decency. Very nice. We were actually not very nice. Number seven, bad hair day. Okay, you want it messed up? Let's do messed up. Hope you're not eating any food right now, especially not eating in the dark. Two red flags. Okay, the Liverpool Daily Post back in 1869 had readers invested on this fateful day. Right on the cover, it read, a 30-year-old passed away in the village of Lincolnshire. Now at the time, that's not far off from average life expectancy in the 1800s. But this case was odd. Everyone wanted to read about this. This case was noteworthy. It was important that folks understood what took this young lady's life. Doctors asked the family if they can carry out a post-mortem, and lo and behold, they found a two-pound solid chunk of hair sitting in her stomach. Two pounds. That's what happened. That's how she met her fate. That's horrible. This ball of hair caused an ulceration of the stomach and ultimately caused her death. The woman's sister did note that over the last dozen years or so, she had casually been eating her own hair. So at this time, I say, if you know anybody eating hair, send them this link. It's not a good idea. Cut that out. Stop doing that. Number six, the Great Famine. Weird time to talk about a famine after the hair incident, but okay, here we go. Back in 1845, a potato crop that a lot of the Irish population relied on was no longer available. This was huge. This is bad history right here. A group of microorganisms wiped them all out, and in result, around one million folks died or had to leave. It was draconian law at this point and British ruling that made the exported food hard to reach people. This famine led to Irish independence and anti-union movements. Historical, definitely. Messed up, absolutely. Number five, Queen Victoria's name change. Every year on May 2-4, we set off fireworks, then we have way too many hot dogs. It's the best. We call it Victoria Day, right? It's for sure called Victoria Day, right? Well, back in 1819, Victoria was christened in an almost private ceremony. It was small, obviously. Victoria's uncle only let a few people attend. Like I mentioned in part one, she had an isolated childhood with the whole Kensington system. That was no way to live. But even the day she was christened, trouble awaited. Her name was Alexandrina Victoria, and at the time, the name Victoria was not regal. It was a French origin, almost an odd name to have at the time, so she was immediately advised to change her name to something more traditional. But as our calendars can definitely confirm, she said, nope, I'm good. Victoria Day, yeah, it's definitely Victoria Day. Number four, tattoos. I only have the one tattoo, but I've always wanted more. Just not so good with needles, you know? 
I got my eyebrow pierced and I fainted. It's a fun fact, by a little scar there. Not great with needles. Some of the designs are so beautiful on tattoos, the amount of pain you all sit through, I'm impressed, honestly, mad respect. The tattoo craze really took off once Queen Victoria's son, the Prince of Wales, he went and visited Jerusalem. And of course he saw copious amounts of body art and was inspired. Inspired, we'll say, yeah. So upon his return, he was all about ink at this point. And the Prince of Wales, well if he has a sleeve, well then maybe I can have a sleeve, right? What's going on? It wasn't a sleeve, really. It was a cross. The prince got a tattoo of a cross in homage to the Crusades. So if you're gonna try and convince your parents to let you get a tattoo, just, you know, tell them the Prince of Wales did, right? You're just trying to be a royal. At number three, corpse medicine. Now earlier I mentioned the whole grave robber industry and how that really took off during the Victorian era, but now let's talk about how they used corpses in their medicine. Back then, some people believed that consuming certain parts of the human body could cure their ailments. I know. Gross, right? One of the more popular medicines back then was a mixture made with human skull and chocolate, and it was believed to cure apoplexy. Back in the Victorian era, medical texts were published describing what parts of the human body could be used to treat specific ailments. One text describes mixing the skull of a young woman with treacle to treat epilepsy. Another text says that you could treat paralysis with a candle made of human fat. Apparently, executioners were linked to this type of medicine as they would, you know, execute someone and then use the remains to become a doctor and treat people's illnesses. Imagine Grey's Anatomy, but with Victorian medicine. Sounds like an interesting thing to watch, but also probably not to experience. At number two, mummies. Speaking of dead people though, people from the Victorian era were oddly fascinated with mummies. I mean, I can understand the fascination to a certain extent because they're old and cool, but of course, these people just had to be extra weird and take that obsession with mummies to heights that they didn't need to be. People used ground up mummies to make paint, Pieces of mummies were sold in jars, and they were even used in advertising. One candy shop put a mummy on display in the store, claiming that it was the daughter of a pharaoh who saved baby Moses. I mean, that's weird, right? I understand that this was all happening as archaeologists were starting to uncover lost treasures and secrets from Egypt, but I mean, a mummy in a candy shop? Seems a little much. And finally at number one, baby farmers. Now for what I believe is probably the most disturbing thing from the Victorian era, baby farmers. Basically, this was an industry of women who would take unwanted babies and either take care of them, give them to new parents, or unfortunately have them disposed of. One famous case of the darker side of baby farmers comes from a woman named Amelia Dyer. She was known to have charged women a lot of money to take their babies off their hands, but unfortunately the children wouldn't survive Amelia's care. It is believed that Amelia was responsible for the passings of hundreds of babies, making her one of the biggest monsters of the Victorian era. Kicking off the list at number 10, dark dining. I don't know about you, but I can't eat in the dark. I need to see every single bite that I'm eating, okay? Call me crazy. Part of me wants to go to a restaurant where you can't see anything, but I know that I won't make it all the way through. I can't do it. I like, I have a thing. I have to just, I'm not blindly, what if it's not cooked? I don't know. Back in the Victorian era, dining in complete darkness wasn't just a date night. It was actually the best way to digest, or so they thought. That's why many Victorian era homes had their dining rooms set up in their basement. How random is that? Oh, do you guys have poker nights down here? Nah, just brunch. Kill the light. <laughs> what? How do you like your eggs? Turn off the light. <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> Number nine, Saved by the Bell. I'm sure you've heard about this at some point, but allow me to go into grim detail. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, everything bad, you name it, it was all spreading. Not an ideal time to be alive. Many were biting the bullet at this time, of course, being gravely ill, but with this came a dark trend. The safety coffin. Yeah, we got a safety, we had the safety dance, now we got the safety coffin, here we go. These coffins, I mean, God forbid you were buried alive, these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again and exit said coffin. A lot of these coffins have extra comfort on the inside and of course, a wire. This wire ran through the coffin, through the ground and attached to a bell on the outside. So if a passerby or heard it, one, that would be so scary, but if they heard it, they would know something's up and they would help them out. Folks would get creative with their safety coffins. For example, a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester, he passed in 1791, but he instructed his family and watchmen to open the special door on his casket, revealing a layer of glass. Now, if anybody were to see condensation, he could then be removed. Patent number 81,437. It was actually granted to Franz Vester in 1868. It was an improved burial case, a real patent. This was a real 
coffin. This is crazy. This one had an air inlet, a ladder, and a bell. All three, there you go. The description of the patent says, if too weak to ascend by the ladder, he could ring the bell, giving the desired alarm for help, and thus save himself from premature death by being buried alive. Nice. You thought you died. Psych, climb this ladder. There you go. Good luck getting up. Now you're in an escape room. Enjoy. You only get two hints. Play a little walkie talkie. Hey, uh, how do I get out of the coffin in room B? Number eight, no air. Now that song's gonna be stuck in your head. Jordan Sparks, a classic. Since we're on the topic of safety coffins, I had to include one more. Maybe two more, I'll never tell. This one is fascinating. The science involved here was honestly impressive. There was the classic wire and bell method, but the more sick people got, the more creative they had to become. Like for example, patent number 268,693, John Krishbaum's device for indicating life in buried persons. Yeah, an 1882 classic, we love this. We got the iPod Nano, they got the device O-Life. Nice. Upon first glance, you may think this is some type of medieval punishment, whatever, but really this device detects movement whilst providing much needed air. Now you obviously can't have a hole in the ground or else rats will make your real demise much worse than suffocating, right? So John's device here, as per the disclosure details, is that if the person buried should come to life, a motion of his hands will turn the branches of the T-shaped pipe upon or near which his hands are placed. A marked scale on the side of the top indicates movement of the T and air will then pass come down the pipe. Once sufficient time has passed to assure the person is dead, the device can be removed. Yeah, imagine waking up with this in your hands. I wouldn't be calm enough to turn it and then breathe in a passive amount of air. No way, there's nothing passive about waking up in a coffin. At number seven, grave robber. When you think of jobs back in the Victorian era, you might think of things like chimney sweeps and lawyers. But another relatively popular, though questionable profession was being a grave robber. Yes, people actually made a living off robbing graves. As people studied medicine, they needed cadavers to practice on, but there was a law saying that only the bodies of those who had been executed for a crime could be used as a cadaver. And since the laws changed to include less and less crimes having death penalties, soon people started running out of cadavers to practice on, and this gave way to the boom in the grave robbing industry. People can make a pretty penny for snatching bodies from cemeteries and selling them to medical professionals and students. Fresher bodies went for more money, and the grave robbers not only made money off the sale of the cadaver, but they also charged a fee, so they ended up with a little extra cash in their pockets. Eventually, the grave robbing business became such a big problem that cemeteries started installing watchtowers and guards to prevent people from getting away with the dead. At number six, beauty. I've talked about this before in some past videos, but the Victorian era was famous for its strange beauty practices, so I just had to include it on this list. You're probably familiar with the makeup from the Victorian era. Women often painted their faces white to look as pale as possible, but even though they believed it made them look beautiful, it also did a lot of harm to their health. The white face paint that women would use was lead based, and as we all by now, lead makes you dead. But this white lead paint isn't the only thing that harms people's skin. Women would also wash their faces with ammonia to make their skin look paler. At night, women would rub opium on their faces, and if they were really dedicated to their beauty regime, they would also ingest arsenic. They were literally poisoning themselves in the name of beauty. Women would also use mercury on their eyebrows and eyelashes, and would use lemon juice or belladonna in their eyes, which could cause blindness in some people. Once again, I'm glad things have changed. At number five, no divorce. Nowadays, divorce is quite common. All you have to do is sign a paper and you're done. But back in the Victorian era, before the Matrimonial Causes Act of 1857 allowed divorce, people had to find different ways of getting rid of their spouses. After all, just because there was no divorce doesn't mean that everyone was happy in their marriages. It turns out that in order to solve their problems and get rid of their spouse, people would just sell their wives, either in public or in private sales. Most of the time, a man would take his wife to the town square and just sell her off to a new man. According to some records, some women had the power to veto a sale, and sometimes it was for cash. Though I think the cheapest that a wife was ever sold for was a pint of beer. This wasn't necessarily bad for the woman, because if she was sold to someone else, things could sometimes work out, and she could live a better life with a better spouse. And if she didn't, then she would just get sold again and get to try her luck with a new man. At number four, food additives. These days, people are becoming more and more concerned with artificial additives in their food. All natural, organic, pesticide, and hormone-free food 
food is becoming more and more popular, but back in the Victorian era, people were putting all kinds of additives in their noms, and a lot of it was really, really bad for you. Like, we're talking deadly. Chalk and alum were often added to bread dough to make it whiter, and sometimes pipe clay, plaster of Paris, or sawdust was added to the mix as well. Red lead was sometimes added to cheese, lead was added to cider, mustard, wine, sugars, and candies. Copper sulfates were used in preserving fruits, jams, and wine. Mercury was used in candies, and even ice cream was made using a water and chalk mixture. All of these unsafe ingredients are actually what prompted the food safety industry because no matter what's going on, you shouldn't be eating lead, chalk, and mercury. Number three, Jack the Ripper. While the man's numbers don't compare to any of the other horrible people in history, he's unusual because of his brutality and the fact that he was never caught. Jack the Ripper was maybe the first modern serial on liver. He haunted the streets of Victorian London and is responsible for claiming multiple women's lives, women of the evening to be exact, and they began to know the name Jack the Ripper. Now, we'll probably just have to show you pictures of Victorian London or maybe some B-roll of a shadowy figure because there ain't no way we can show the crime scenes. There's probably a dozen different theories on who done it. Some say it was multiple men using his name as an alias. Some say it was Prince Albert. There's even some who suggest that he was a she, and which explains why women were so easy to go off with Jack. That actually kind of makes sense to me at least, and why no one really would be looking for a woman back then. Kind of makes sense. Anyway, be careful out there, ladies. Just, just be careful. Number two, Queen Victoria. It seems old blight herself may have been a tad more promiscuous than you'd think a royal to be. Well, not with other men, but her husband. Who in her diary claims to be the love of her life, which honestly is kind of sweet and, and romantic. That's nice. One thing that I find interesting, however, is that while lewd images were outlawed, the queen may have commissioned a painting of herself that was quite risque for the time. To gift to her husband, of course. Hypocrisy much? I say lewd, but it was probably just in her loose fitting clothes with maybe like an ankle showing or something. Still, unusual behavior for the queen. I'll remember that when next time, Bly. I'll remember that. Number one, Prince Albert. If you've ever stepped foot into a tattoo parlor, then you might know where I'm going with this. Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, had some controversy circulating his name. One, because he shares a name with another Prince Albert, who was speculated to be Jack the Ripper, but also because of a very unique piercing. Go ahead and take a guess where that piercing is. Yeah, I didn't think so. As a man, if your anatomy could be described by an internet comedian using moderately funny euphemisms, then the piercing would go through your German army helmet. That makes sense, right? The horror, the absolute horror. It's rumored that he had one of these piercings. Did he? I, I'm not sure. But if it means anything to you, Nicholas II had a tattoo, so it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. 